a renewed mind, a renewed mind. So I want to begin here um, with dispositions. You know, another word for dispositions is mindset. Amen. Now, there are several aspects to our mindsets or our disposition as humans. There is a negative aspect. And in the negative, what is the difference, do you think? Uh, why does one person see his or her work as a burden? And when you ask him or her to do something, they moan and they groan about how much they already are obligated to do. And then on the positive aspect of disposition, the other person sees all the requests as joy. They not only agree to do what is asked of them, but they do it well, they do it quickly, and they even ask, they even do more than what is asked. You know, so mindset and disposition is what we're talking about today in the renewed mind. There are negative aspects to it, there are positive aspects to it, and then there is a a, a vision of the world, which we call outlook. See, optimism versus pessimism. See, the glass to some people is always half full, which is hopeful and optimistic. But on the other hand, the glass is half empty, you know, because if you're a pessimist, what you see is the void, you know. And I'd like to compare these two viewpoints and two visions of life to uh, Voltaire's Candide. Voltaire is a French writer of the 18th century, and has uh, created this character named Candide, to whom everything that happened in her life was for the better. Regardless of whether it was tragic, painful, no matter the adversity, she just had this bubbling positive you know, uh, disposition that everything that happened was for infinitely the better. You know, contrast that with what uh, we call the Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law. In Murphy's Law, everything that can go wrong shall go wrong. You know, that's another disposition. So technically, we're talking about a mindset where people are either really optimistic and hopeful and, and glasses half full, or a disposition where everything that could go wrong will go wrong, and they're negative, and they're pessimist, and they're, you know, those are the two uh, dimensional outlooks of mindsets. But there is a solution. And the Bible uh, you know, proffers a solution. And it says, what makes the difference between these different viewpoints, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, you know, whether you know uh, you are hopeful, you know, or a fatalist or resigned that everything that could go wrong will go wrong. The difference, the Bible's answer is a renewed mind. A renewed mind is the solution to this variation and the variables in these positions. See, Paul tells us in our anchor scripture today, Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, so I want to delve a little deeper into this solution for the remainder of this message because we can deal with negative the negative aspect of our mindset and the positive aspect and we can be either caught up in uh, one negative outlook or positive outlook but the solution to dealing with these variations is to have our minds renewed constantly amen let us go further now and look at the renewal process. How is our mind renewed? See, renewal signifies calibration, you know, recalibration. Uh, some people, you know, are described as dead set in their ways, meaning they can't change. They have a way of being that they are comfortable with, and they would rather not, you know, have anyone encroach. They're incapable of making changes. But in the opposite calibration of that is the rebirth. See, every believer is born again. And when we are born again, something happens to our mindset. And it begins to change. And we begin not only to think of ourselves as individuals, but we also think of ourselves as part of the body. You know, our hearts become more pliable. And for the opposite of that is adamant. 
You know, it's a heart that is unrepentant, as hard as stone. Amen. Now let's look at the scripture verse in Romans chapter uh, 12, verses 3 through 5. The Apostle Paul writes, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he or she ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. See, in the renewing of our mind, we have to recalibrate and think of ourselves, not highly, you know, you know, but think of God having dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. According to that measure, think of yourself. For as many as for as we have many members in one body, this is where the individual versus corporate comes in, uh, but all members do not have the same functions. See, your hand does not have the same function as your legs. Now, there are some acrobats who can walk on their hands, but it isn't really meant for that. So the cross-functionality of the different parts of the body is important in recalibrating our mindset. We don't all function the same. Every, every part, every body part has a specific function, but we all work together. Right? Verse 5, so being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So to be in sync, to be corporate, to be a corporate entity, we can't have our legs going in a different direction than the rest of our body. Similarly, we can't have our mind or our head thinking in a different direction than the rest of the body. So everything has to work together. Everything has to be synchronized, you know, and that is the job of the mind that speaks to the soulish realm. Amen. So as we uh, uh, continue looking at this subject of a renewed mind, I want us to look at the soul. Amen. The soul. The soul is at the heart of everything. The soulish realm. You see, in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Now, some of your versions will say he became a living soul. It is that God, the breath of God, the spirit of God that infused life into the body that was made from clay, from the dust of the earth. See, so Lord breathed, the Lord breathed into a body of clay, the spirit of life. And the scripture says man became a living soul. Now, so if we were to break this down, the nature of of man is triune, just like God. Remember, God made man in his own image. You know, we have a triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and man made in his image is also triune or tripartite. See, the highest part of his nature is the inbreathed spirit that he received from God. The lowest part of his nature is the dust or clay that came from the ground. The union of the uh, dust, the body, and the spirit, the union of these two brought about or brought into being something that has not existed before, and that is a living soul. So man consists of the spirit, soul, and body. And God's purpose was that man should relate to God directly through his spirit, you know, through his spirit. But we lost that. And I want to talk about how we lost that. Amen. We lost that because of the fall of man. You see, the adversary of our soul, Satan, the devil, has a grift. And that grift, that ruse, was concocted at the very beginning of the book of Genesis. See, God gave instructions in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. He says, you can eat of every tree in this garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That is the word of God. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, the serpent, the devil, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And the serpent said to the woman, 
Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat nor touch it, lest you die. And here is the, the gift. Satan said to the woman, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. And of course, they ate. The consequence of it was that they disobeyed God and they did not die a biological or physical death, but something definitely happened. They died a spiritual death. Now, over the course of Christendom, there has been many uh, controversies about whether or not we are uh, born with a soul that is eternal and that we all possess an indestructible part of us, of, of us and, and, and so on and so forth and different analysis. But the Bible is clear on the gift of God, our God's gift in Romans chapter two, verses six through 10, I'm reading it again from the New Living Translation. He, that's God, will judge everyone according to what they have done. And pay attention to verse seven. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. Now, why would God give us the gift of eternal life if according to the gift of Satan, we already have the eternal life? You see the conflict. So because of this fall, because of this uh, fission, when God, when man fell in the Garden of Eden, we immediately were disconnected from that eternal spirit of God that was meant to interact and, and, and direct our intercourse with God. You know, so that fissure, that breakdown is what Christ came to reconcile. It is what Christ came to give as a gift. It is the kernel of, it is the reconnection of that break, bridging of this gap that is the uh, mission of salvation. Hallelujah. You see, verse eight, but he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves who refuse to obey the truth, instead live lives of wickedness. Verse nine, there will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, you know, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, meaning universal. Verse 10, but there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. You know, so the gift of God negates the grift of Satan. Hallelujah. So we have to be equipped with this new mindset that we are not created to be eternal beings because it says very clearly in Romans uh, 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. So I want to talk now about the spirit and the soul. Amen? The spirit and the soul. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, the Bible says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Now, here it is. If the soul is indestructible, well, how can it be killed? Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Gehana is the, is the uh, Greek word or the Hebrew word that, that is used there. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 echoes the same sentiment. For God, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. So the, there is a difference, a distinction between the soul and the spirit, even though in some instances these are used interchangeably. And, and here it, it says a division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, there's often confusion about the human spirit versus the human soul. You know, in places, scripture seems to use the term interchangeably, but there might be a subtle difference. Otherwise, how could the word of God penetrate even to dividing the soul from the spirit? Hallelujah. Amen. Let's look further at this. You see, he 
is a being who possesses, he, a man, is a being who possesses a mind, emotion, and will. If we view the word soul as the ability to express emotion, then yes, God has a soul. He is not soulless in the sense of having no feeling, but we normally use the word soul in the context of humanity, not in the spiritual context. See, in fact, some would define soul as the immaterial part of us that you can't pinpoint that links the spirit with the body. The father is not human. He is spirit, the Bible tells us. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. The Holy Spirit is also immaterial. He's not visible. He's not tangible. You can't touch him. The son has a human body and a human soul and spirit because he's a true human being. The God man who makes intercession for us speaks to the intimacy, the melding, the oneness, that exists between us and the spirit realm. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, uh, uh, the apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth saying, or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You know, so clearly, in order to be directed, to be spirit-led, we have to be joined. And that is where the indwelling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the life of a believer, the indwelling Spirit of God, is our path to victory. It is this indwelling Spirit that directs us, that, you know, teaches us, brings things to our remembrance, brings renewals to our mindset, brings new re renewal and rebirth to our soul. It is the indwelling spirit of God that recalibrates our mind. It is he that sets us on a course of victory in the life that we have chosen now to live in Lord. Hallelujah, the spirit and the soul. Now let us wrap this up by talking about this renewed mind. What are the marks, if you will, what are the hallmarks of a renewed mind? The apostle Paul goes to tell us in verses 9 to 18 of Romans chapter 12, the hallmarks of a renewed mind. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. If your mind is renewed, love unconditionally. Don't fake it. Abhor what is evil. You know, stay away, resist evil, <coughs> and cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. So a renewed mind is one that is affectionate to one another with brotherly love and sisterly love, and in honor, giving preference to one another. Verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, Verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saint, given to hospitality. A hallmark of a renewed mind is one that is hospitable, one that responds to the needs of the uh, brethren. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You know, cursing is not the hallmark of a renewed mind. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep or mourn with those who mourn. Be of the same mind towards one another. And here it is. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate yourself with the humble. You know, do not be wise in your own opinion. 17, repay no evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And lastly, if it is possible, as much as lie or depend on you, live peaceably with all men and all women, and all of God's creatures. So this renewed mind speaks to a submission to the authority of Christ through the Holy Spirit. A mind that is renewed is a mind that is totally submitted to the Holy Spirit of God, and, and the Holy Spirit directs your affairs, directs your judgment, directs your actions, 
directs everything that you do and brings you in alignment with the spirit of the almighty God so that his perfect will for your life is manifested in your actions. So that is the renewed mind, the soul strategy, the one that the Holy Spirit directs in our lives. Now, I want to give you an opportunity today, if you have not made Jesus the Lord and personal Savior of your life, a renewed mind is not ascribed to you. So I want you to partake of this renewal. And the first step towards doing this, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9 of the Living Bible, for if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your own heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So friends, I want you to pray with me. Say a prayer. Believe it sincerely in your heart. Call this the sinner's prayer. It doesn't matter if you're doing this right now simultaneously during this broadcast, or if you're doing this at a later date, listening to the sound of my voice, all that is necessary, the promise endures. All that is necessary for this to uh, work in your life is for you to sincerely believe it and to genuinely repent. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life today. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Now, friend, if you just said that prayer for the first time, welcome to the kingdom of God. You are now a bona fide child of God and you're walking in his grace. Your work, your uh, bequest of renewed mind is imminent. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is available to you, you know, and don't let the enemy, the adversary of our souls, deceive you. This is why I want to leave you with three quick instructions of what you must do to stay in this state. Three things you must do. Number one, talk to God every day. We call that prayer. Now you say, Dr. Ben, what, what, pray, what, what, what do I say to God? You know, you talk to God about everything that you care about, every need that you have, every uh, concern, every pain or ache. God wants you to talk to him. So you talk to God as your Abba Father. We have an, a father-child relationship, you know, and read the Bible. Number two, read the Bible every day. God talks to you through his word. You say, how? You know, you will read a familiar verse of scripture and the Holy Spirit who indwells you will begin to, you know, uh, reveal uh, words to you of wisdom, revelation knowledge, and you'll begin to uh, sort out different uh, challenges that you have. And he will even uh, speak through you to resolve challenges of people in your circuit, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your, at your job. You know, verse three, uh, number three, join a Bible-believing church and you will grow and mature into the purpose of God's calling in your life. You have a standing invitation to join us here at Grace Gate Church every Sunday. We bless God for your life. We thank God because the big quest of the renewed mind is for you. The renewed mind is how we overcome these dispositional variables of uh, negative uh, mindset and positive mindset of pessimism and optimism and of falling between these dispositions of one time sad, one time happy. You know, the, the, the renewed mind does not conform to this world, but it overcomes it through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now let us pray. I pray that the Lord Almighty God